Hey guys, welcome to the CPD Junkie Podcast, where we bring you interviews with dentists sharing their CPD stories and journeys from around Australia. What better way to learn than to follow those who've already done it before? CPD Junkie is Australia's most comprehensive CPD, so head over to cpdjunkie.com.au and become a member for free to access the full features of the site. I'm your host, Lawrence Doan, and today we're joined by Dr. Shravan Chunduru. Shravan graduated and uh, qualified as a dentist in Adelaide and spent several years working in rural Victoria in which he gained an appreciation for managing patients with failing dentitions and complex restorative needs. It is with this experience he completed a specialization in prosthodontics at the University of Sydney to expand his knowledge and experience in advanced restorative treatment of worn, failing and missing teeth. He has practiced in Sydney for many years um, in public hospital, private, and university settings. Shravan also works at the Adelaide Dental Hospital part-time as a consulting specialist prosthodontist. He has a special interest in managing patients with failing or no teeth, removal of dentures, and planning of dentures or implants. Dr. Shravan Chunduru, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Lawrence. So before you were a specialist, you were a general dentist working in rural Victoria. Uh, where did your CPD or dental journey start? Well, funnily enough, it actually probably started a bit earlier in high school where um, I was actually on a pathway to doing IT. So my, my father nurtured that a little bit and enrolled me into a few IT courses for programming and all sorts of other things and work experience, even some in India, actually. So. <laughs> So on a, on a visit to India, we, um, we had a short course in Java programming and I had actually never used Java before and never used Java since. Yeah. So, <laughs> but the, the point was, I think he was trying to nurture as much of my interest in IT as possible, but I actually decided, no, that's not the way I wanted to go and went down. Um, uh, and that was from my work experience that showed what working life as a, an IT programmer, engineer and everything is like. And I didn't like it, to be honest. <laughs> I wanted, um, so we, uh, so I pivoted um, and started aiming for um, dentistry uh, as uh, my parents wanted me to aim for medicine, but that's a different story <laughs> altogether. <laughs> but yeah, so, um, and then, yeah, I think my very, my very first dental CPD outside of university would have actually been endodontics. So I did a very, uh, I did a two day hands-on and didactic endodontic course at the University of Melbourne. And that was actually by necessity because uh, we trained endodontics hand files mostly um, at, at the time I was at uni. And, at, and I think the, the, the subsequent years after that had experience with rotary systems. I had zero experience with rotary systems. So, so I, I, I made that as my very first CPD course because I wanted to go straight into app applying what I was learning into my clinical practice. So I did that two days um, course over a weekend in Melbourne yeah and straight away i was able to be a lot more confident and comfortable with um rotary endodontics yeah that, that would have been pretty cutting edge back then hey because i think the universities probably weren't incorporating that so much at that time it was it was being introduced gradually and i think the first groups that had it were the ones that had endodontics as an elective subject and as when we had uh, I don't know if that's still the case, but we had elective topics that we could do in our final years. Right. So, yeah. So the elective topic was, I think, ran by Peter, um, Prof. Cathro at the time. Yes. Um, and whereas the, the, the normal endodontic stream at that time didn't have rotary. So, yes. um, in fourth year. So, right. Yeah. So, and I then you that's... had that in your practice as well, you said. So that's why you wanted yeah, to yeah, get more into it. And that's, exactly the reason um it was a it was a practice equipped with rotary instruments um that knowing that they use pro tapers i wanted to go into a course that would not only just talk about endodontics generally but also specifically how to use pro taper and other files mm, so yeah. um so yeah it was it was 
very much selected on the basis of hands-on and directly applicable to what I was what I was trying to get extra skills in at the yeah. time. And then what you what what was the next CPD that you decided to do after that? Um, a lot of that was basically just some some ongoing. Um, some of them were from companies. Some of them were from um, people in Melbourne because that's where most of the CPDs were. Um, and um, I think the yeah, so I think I went down to Melbourne for um, um, one on all on four. Um, just as an introduction and at the time that seemed like a sales pitch to um get referrers essentially as opposed to learning very much a lot about the um the process and the procedure wow so yeah, yeah so some some things were informative and other things were essentially sales pitch into other things or to referring to them for other things essentially so yeah and it's it was difficult at the time to work out what was what <laughs> yeah yeah i guess it's tricky because like back then nobel biocare was pretty big and all in four was probably an up and coming very exciting topic um that they were kind of promoting more about i'm surprised yes. you went and jumped straight into learning about all in four straight away at that time well it was it was an opportunistic thing as opposed to something i sought out so um i think we had a few people from the area all sort of jump in carpool to go to this one so that's kind yeah. of um it, it kind of worked out that way um so and like with anything you, you don't know what you don't know so yeah. um and and that's something that was very common as an as an early new grad is that you is i found that i knew certain things and i knew them really well but then outside of those things, it was it was almost like a, an endless desert of information that um, you, and you didn't know which one's the right direction to go in or whether you're going to like the the additional types of things or whether or, or purely just from a treatment planning perspective, whether these uh, these options exist. And sometimes you didn't even know they existed at the time. So, yeah. And and that was probably what um uh led me to seek more and more because at the time i just there was gaps in the knowledge that yeah. university only provided so much in yes. terms of the, the enormous breadth of what we can do in dentistry so yeah and was it because you were talking to your your boss at the time who was telling you oh there's these seminars that were coming up or was it that you were talking to friends and your friends were like ah oh, actually this is something that's coming up i would like to attend do you want to come along yeah, it's, it was a mix of both, actually. So um, um, the boss suggested courses that I think he also thought would be useful from from his point of view in, in terms of getting us upskilled to do certain things in the practice. Yeah, all and of then all. We, uh, he he <laughs> was he 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 attended that one himself as well. So that I think he um he he was an implant surgeon. So he yeah. So I think there was a the, there was an element of um getting us familiar familiarized with that as well um yeah. not that he does many himself or he didn't at the time so yeah. um so yeah it, it was it was interesting that way um but as i said the endodontics one i did a really big um composite course um so and it was more like adhesive bonding and um and that was a that was an an, an all day one so it was bonding ceramics composite and that was that blew my mind because at the time we were only really familiar with um pbm crowns gold crowns and you know just a, an assortment of cements that we had in dental school yeah and then after that it was kind of like wait there's so many different products out there so many different adhesive mechanisms which are now a lot more well known but yes. at the time i was like oh i'm just cementing pbms with um with the GRC and that was really <laughs> pretty much the, yeah. limit, the limiting factor at that point is my, my knowledge and my confidence in doing adhesive dentistry for example so mm -hmm. yeah. and was that what ended up catapulting you into deciding you wanted to specialize like what, what that happened? was that was one um there was another one that was really really pivotal for me and this is comes back down to the you don't know what you don't know 
uh, we came across a lot of worn dentition um, and eros erosion and bruxism wear and that sort of stuff. And I'd, I'd be looking at that, scratching my head, thinking, how am I going to approach this? I don't. And the first thing that sort of came into my mind was probably, you know, pull out teeth and do immediate dentures. But then not everyone wanted that. Yeah. But then, although some did. So that um, that became one of my common things um, in my general practice is that I did quite a lot of immediate full upper, full lower dentures right um for failing dentitions but i wanted to know what can i do if the person said no i want to keep the teeth yeah and oftentimes I, as i said I'll, i'd be a bit puzzled as to how do i how do i approach that yeah so i shelled out a lot of cash to go to sydney yeah and i did a um a a, a, an, a two day fairly big lecture series on full mouth rehabilitation yeah so and that and that was just it was like a primer it was yeah. you, you you're touching on lots of different topics that um in when i look at it now it's essentially like um touching on every topic of our pros pros course or pros degree right right in full mouth rehab so yes but um did i but the question was did i walk away feeling like i'm confident in doing full mouth rehabs the answer was not really Right, and that right. was just me personally, yeah. Because although they did talk about concepts, how to do it, what's the workflow, all of that sort of stuff, I didn't have the experience. I didn't have the hand that could guide me. I yes. guess in that sense, and I realised that there were those things that were lacking in application of that in my practice. Right. So that was probably a big driver for me to go into pros is I wanted that, that almost like, um, someone that can supervise and really guide you as to how to work up patients, how to select materials, how to treatment plan. Right. Yeah. So it's more, more like that at the time that you were, you were, you started doing, you had all these tough cases and complex cases going on. And then you decide, actually, I want to go educate myself on it. And then you yes. went and educated yourself on it. And you realize that actually, there's actually so much more that I don't understand. And, um, going back, you didn't feel comfortable with it. And that's really yeah. what got you interested into specializing. Absolutely. So yeah. for me personally, I think the application of those concepts could vary depending on what, what skills you went to the seminar to beforehand. Yeah. And, and as I said, I think it was a, a light bulb moment. It was like, I actually didn't know as much as I thought I did in that yeah. sense. So, right. and, and it's, and as, a, and these sort of things weren't particularly commonplace in dental school either because most of the focus was on single unit dentistry conformative dentistry not mm. reorganization um and the the whole overall occlusion the bite everything like that so right yeah and then so uh, you ended up specializing how did you find yeah. it uh that was it was um it was a challenge um because before specializing um we had to well be, before getting getting into the specialty was also a bit of a challenge to begin with because we had to go through um the primaries the racds primaries which i think yes. a lot of a lot of your viewers either have done or, or are contemplating doing so um and that also was an eye-opening experience in terms of um, getting myself back into a mode where study um would become part of my life again yeah. Because at the time, other than the CPDs, I was just working, earning money, going home, spending time, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, doing all sorts of other things, and then, then going back into a routine of oh, going home, studying for three, four hours, uh, going to the um, uh, the the primary course, you know, the orientation course in Sydney, yeah, and yeah, and that was just a bit. It was a bit of an eye-opening experience for my wife and I, and I just tried to. <laughs> um, uh, and I think I went into it really not very confident. Yeah, is a short answer. So, mm -hmm. 
I went through the like the the written exams and the interviews, thinking that oh uh, yeah, I'm gonna fail. I'm gonna need to resit this again. You know, I've resigned myself to that point, but I yeah. didn't want to not try. I didn't want yeah. to not do it. So I took the exams, and yeah, and I was surprisingly I, I did pass. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's one <laughs> that's one hurdle over. Then going through this, then. I applied for my the specialties in all the different programs. Um, yes. As you know, I got into Sydney, so I, I moved to Sydney, essentially. Yes. So that was another life challenge, but, but that's not part of that talk today. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from regional Victoria into into a, a, a city that's much bigger than my hometown of Melbourne. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, yeah. And then, then from there, we moved on to, like, um, getting back into that routine of studying. For me, also, the other thing that was a big learning curve um, was um, learning laboratory work. So, and this is what I learned is that the Sydney DMD um, graduates yes. who did their their course in, in Sydney, even even at that, um, that, that, that level, they were doing a lot more lab work than we did in our, in our Adelaide course. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they were making special trays, wax rims, setting up teeth, with the assistance of the the lab techs, of course, but not right. so it's not completely you know on their own. But yes, the point is they were actually viewing and and seeing some of the behind the scenes that we normally don't see if we drop things off at the lab and then it magically appears. You know, yeah, it's all set up. Teeth were like, not flaring out everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so. Um, so that was a bit of a learning curve is to learn how to do um, laboratory work. Yeah. And I think that's um, something that uh, on top of that, then you've got the usual tutorials, clinic, treatment planning, study. Um, I think it consumed most of our time up until maybe um, 6.37 most nights. Yeah. So uh, because we had we would finish the end of the day, then we'd have to trim up our models that we took um, articulate them wax ups plans yes or setting up dentures or <laughs> doing all that sort of stuff yeah um and well, well yeah. let's 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 get back into the the primaries part of things you know sometimes sure, when you're sure. applying some of the viewers are probably wondering you know how i mean primaries is one aspect but sometimes it's like demonstrating that you've got an interest in pros isn't it is something that's important as well or absolutely yeah i think the um um, the primaries is the one aspect for, um, as I said, from getting back into the swing of studying and m managing your time and yeah. prioritizing and also just learning our dentistry again, you know, the, the basics that we would have probably forgotten from first and second years. Yes. So. Yes. And, um, and then from there is, um, the demonstrated interest in pros, which um, from from my point of view was the CPD that I was going through. Yes. So showing that you've done CPD towards pros, for example, or yes. towards your particular specialty that you're interested in. Yes. Um, then then also uh, uh, depending on the the course, um, some of them had um, portfolios that you had to show, you know, um, or a case presentation. Yeah. And for, from our point of view, they were they were looking at how we can articulate, how we can d discern what's the important parts of a case to present. Mm. And lo and behold, they're actually preparing us for our case presentations as we go through our course by oh, doing wow. that. Yeah, yeah. Because so, some of the feedback I got from that was useful for as we go through our course. You know? Right, so, right. I follow. Yeah. I follow. And then and, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. So then we just. So, um, and sort of what sort of journals you were reading was one of the common questions we got asked in the, in those interviews as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and also what, what are your plans? What do you want to do beyond, um, your pros or your specialty program? What, what are your intentions or your interests, etc. Yes. And I think that's part of the reason why they don't, um, they recommend you to at least have a couple of years of um, general dental experience before you apply mm -hmm. because then you can build up that uh, at least a level of um, understanding of the, the discipline that you want to try and get into so yeah 
Fair enough. So yeah, yeah. that that makes us into the point where okay, so now you've graduated, right? Yeah. So how did you find you know that part of things? So I had um, um, I had an interest in teaching, and I still do. And mm -hmm. so um, in my before pros, I was also teaching general dentistry in La Trobe Uni um, in Wodonga. So not not in Bendigo, but in the other um, rotation that they had. Yeah. So um, so I think I wanted to continue that, or at least foster that a little bit. So I took up a clinical tutoring position in the university. So I worked two days a week with the university, pretty much um, almost all clinical teaching, clinical yeah. tutoring. Uh, then, then the, the other times I was working in, um, the, the hospital. So the hospital I was working in, um, in Westmead mostly. So, um, with a small stint in private practice as well. So, uh, and that was about half a day to a day a week. Right. So, yeah. So, so and, do, you know, do specialists when they graduate prefer to set up their own shop or work with someone else first, or do they want to work in a team of specialists? And I think that varies from person to person is the short answer. Yeah. So, um, as I said, my, um, my initial thought was, um, um, was to throw my net out, cast my net out and work out what it is I love, what it is I wanted to continue on and fostering mm. in terms of my interests. And, and that, and that's not just the, the work environment, but also the types of procedures I wanted to do, the types of things I wanted to learn more about. Um, and as you can probably tell, um, a specialist's CPD life does not stop at <laughs> graduation of the specialty degree. I think I went on and did far more CPD after my specialty degree than I did <laughs> before. So, right, right. Tell us, yeah. tell us about that. So what? So yeah. where did you go from there? Because now are you looking at international? Are you looking at still local yes. ones or like where's? Um, and there, 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 there is. I had a lot of opportunities, and I'm very thankful for a lot of those opportunities because I don't think I would have gotten them had I not gone through my pros degree and and. So, um, so mix of interstate, international, and and local stuff. So, what, um, probably the so the the first international one was the um, the ICP conference, International College of Prosthodontics. Yes. In Korea, mm -hmm. and so that was my first time in Seoul as well. So, <laughs> so I, I, um, and we actually tied that up with our with my wife's honeymoon um uh, honeymoon with my wife and i in japan as well perfect so, <laughs> perfect so we um so we went between the two countries for um yeah uh, for the icp part in korea yes. and and toured around in both countries and we um and and that exposed us to all of these big name um prosthodontics and, and other prosthodontic related um, academics and speakers that we would only, at that point, we would, I would only have read about in our journals, for example. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I, I presented my research there as a poster. So, and people come across, ask questions about it as usual. Yes. And, um, and basically, um, I think the, the, um, who was it? that came across the, there was one, um, yes, that's right. So the biggest name that came across to, to look at my poster was Matthias Kern. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, and he, he introduced himself and I'm like, uh, in my head, I'm like, oh, wow, it's Matthias Kern. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, you really kind of knew what he looked like beforehand, right? Or was it the of, name badge he was walking? Sort of. Sort of. Yeah. 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 Um, but then, yeah, the introduction made it, you know, clearer, obviously. So, <laughs> and then he looks at my poster and he goes, oh, can you send me a copy of your poster? And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I got his email and I sent him a copy of my poster. So uh, my, my, my research was on zirconia. And as you know, he's done a lot of um, research and textbooks on resin bonded bridges, which is yes. um, um, including in metal and in, and in all ceramic and zirconia. So, so I can, I can see that he had an interest in, you know, 
my, my findings on my research and he's just probably added to his catalog of information <laughs> at the time. <laughs> right. So, yeah, so that's, that's, that's an interesting story. Um, but, yeah, so that, that was probably my biggest um, international one to start with. Yes. Um, and then I did a, a lot of different courses in, in REMPROS, occlusion, uh, TMD, um, and and also and also going through pros societies. Um, I was I was a member of the prosthodontic society, so there would be different people coming in from interstate and sometimes overseas mm-hmm. doing talks there. So um, short answer is is my my CPD just kept going, and and I'm really glad it did. <laughs> yeah. So so basically, when you graduate, you I mean, for for in your case, you went overseas and did the um, international conference, and that was kind of like a good stepping stone to kind of branch out and see what was available outside, Absolutely, interact with yeah. other people. And then you came yeah. back and joining the specialist society. That was another way to find out, oh, what's coming to Australia that would be yeah. relevant that I could attend. Yes. And, and we, and initially, as I said, as a member, we'd see, um, they would, they'll bring in occasionally, um, international conferences like one, um, once every year or two years as well in international speakers so um we had prof sadowski um as well as um um Urs broadbeck so they're they're big um prof sadowski is a big name in the us for implantology mm. and Urs broadbeck was um was a lot on uh, ceramics crown bridge uh, including the laboratory side of things as well so right and that was through that was through the Prof society and at the moment we have we can't bring in anyone you know internationally so of course of course yeah so it's a bit hard to do things like that at the moment but that was that was what we tried to do um and tried to attend and things like that yeah when and, would you uh, say you know a recent graduate should you know um join the society like a specialist group and you know what can they kind of expect to kind of get out from it yeah so the specialist societies i think the the main reason for for new graduates is is to meet other people so other general dentists other specialists um well and this and plus or minus all the the speakers that would, would would turn up to that and it's a good way to learn who it is that who is out there who's who can potentially be um help uh who could actually help new graduates whether it be through mentoring or 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 anything like that um i mean that's that there's nothing i don't think there's anything formal like that but it's just uh and socializing you know just to know um who 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 your local specialists are for example Mm. so and that's one way to meet them um particularly in the specialist of of your um interest or choosing so whether it be orthodontics endodontics oral surgery all, all of the societies um all of the special i think most of the specialties have a uh, a branch specific of group. Yeah. a specific group so obviously i'm i'm inter- in, involved in the prosthodontic society um, of course. but if you had, <laughs> if you had if you had um interest in endodontics then or perio then you would join um you i would consider joining their their societies as well so um and and yeah just meeting people of similar interests as well so it, it just and and as a social event i mean you, we work quite hard a lot of us and mm-hmm. um and sometimes these are these these are the things that bring us out in weekdays you know otherwise we'd be going home and, <laughs> and looking looking after our families and that sort of stuff as well so yeah um, one, one of the questions that one of our viewers were asking as well was, you know, as someone who's worked for another senior um, specialist first, are their limitations yeah. the same as that for a general dentist associate? Or is like, you know, like access to materials, maybe the types of procedures you might be doing? Yeah, so I think, um, I think overall, um, most, most practices are structured as um, um, SFAs or um, um, service facility agreements. Um, and in in those instances particularly um uh or if or as an employee for example so um if if you're an employee obviously you're restricted by um the the types of materials that are within that practice or within that organization so as a sf as an sfa you could you could ask for 
materials probably a little bit more um, that if, if it's something that everyone's mutually interested in, so they, they got it in for us. Um, mm. If it's something where it's more more for me and the others weren't really that interested in, um, I tended to try and source it myself if I could. Of course. So, of course. yeah, so I think it just really depends on um, who's interested in what, I guess. And yes. um, um, as you know, that the, there are... Um, and and um, I... At first, I was hesitant to buy things myself, and I started doing that more and more, and realizing, you know, yeah, sometimes it's better to. If uh, you want it, you should you go out and get it. If no one else is, yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Like in in my current situation as well now, like sometimes I feel like there's particular resources that I would like to have that would complement what I'm doing, especially when we've learned about it through CPD. But exactly, you know, yeah. Um, the practice might not the the practice might not be purchasing it, so I go out of my way to go and get it to at least uh, provide and complement it. Yeah. You know, it could so, be as simple as, I guess, um, for a general dentist, maybe like a camera, like, you know, your practice might not have a digital 100%. camera. So, you know, you <laughs> yeah. go get, you got to get the camera to take it to the next level. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree with that one. That's probably the biggest um, purchase. I'd, I'd, um, that's probably one of the first purchases I'd recommend for um, if you having your own camera has the benefit of if you work in multiple places, you can take it around with you as opposed yeah. to. Um, you know, you take the photos, you forget to download it onto your USB left there and you're, and then you can't look at it for a week or then, then the technician's calling is like, where's the photos? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. But I said I was going to send, you know, that, that, these are the sort of things that, no. but yeah, the camera, um, having your own cameras has, has benefits that way. And then you can pick the one, um, I have um, two Nikon's, um, and both of them I was using as um, hobby cameras before before dental as well. Yeah. So, so for me that transition was a bit smoother. I just had to buy new lens and flash, yes. and and I could use it as a dental camera. So perfect, perfect. You know, yeah. get best of both worlds. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you you said you had like an interest in software and computer. Did that yes. have anything to do with? what you talk a lot about now which is digital den uh, dentures you know you know well, what are your thoughts on them now and you no know, where do you think it's going to take us i think um yeah so digit like with anything it's a tool so understanding where the tool is beneficial and where it still has limitations so um what's the current limitation is uh, and to know the limitations you need to know what's what the procedure that you're trying to do requires. So if you're looking at full dentures, for example, the traditional complete full upper denture requires some level of peripheral compression around the um, peripheries of the denture. So to get the peripheral compression, can an optical scanner or an optical camera do that? The answer is probably not. Mm. So, um, what's the, so then what's the next step? is can or can we then take an impression and then optically scan the impression and that's a possibility so these are the sort of um um so just sort of not just saying oh i just want to do a digital denture yeah. but understanding the whole process of acquisition design manufacture delivery maintenance you know that sort of stuff so and that goes not just with dentures but also with all all forms of digital dentistry so including cerex and um, implant crown and bridge all of that sort of stuff so um, so from that point of view I was looking for um, scanners that can do more and more things uh, for the types of work I do as you know I do quite a bit of um, com removable pros but also all, all right. forms of pros in general yes so I didn't want so if I was just doing removable pros and removable pros only I'd probably be looking more at a desktop scanner to right. scan impressions you know that and you can probably do that a lot more easier and a lot more accurately from that mm. point of view but because i also do crown bridge work implantology all of that sort of stuff i um it felt like i needed to change and do more um get get something that can potentially do more and so that's where i went into something like the prime scan for example from dense supply so because I can actually scan impressions with that as well, as well wow, as doing, yeah. um, as well as um, doing um, 
crown and bridge scanning and that sort of stuff as well. So, uh, so whereas if if I if you asked me a few years ago, I don't think any of the intraoral scanners would be able to do um, um, a scan of a, a complete denture impression, for example. At least not not to the accuracy, or not yeah. be able to stitch it up properly. So, yeah. so that's one. That's the yes. acquisition. And then, then the next step is is probably a bit more out of our control and more in the laboratory control. So the design and the manufacture. Yes. So that's where I think a lot of um, things are heading is um, is the design and manufacturers getting more and more digital, mm -hmm. but would still need the analog touch, <laughs> I guess, in that sense. So, so hence I, I don't think I. I'm, I'd be game enough to do a full denture from start to finish completely digitally is the short answer. Yes, yes. So, but there I mean, are, but I, there are I, aspects you could, yeah. But I mean, like, it, it smoothens it out, right? The process, the, the flow, like, whereas before you would have to send it, wait for it to come back, but now you can just email it across and then they could yeah, so, start the process. Yes, and, and, and have been able to do that as well. So, for, um, so take, taking away less logistics of it. So I've been getting, um, for example, um, 3D manufactured custom tracks from 3D printed. So, and they, they're sent from intraoral scans that have been emailed. And then a few days later, it comes in the mail. So, you know, just... <laughs> nice and easy. You know, one, yeah. I remember back at uni, um, I was uh, on Seric Files because so someone introduced it to me and they were talking about like incorporating um milled chrome um not, not chrome sorry milled dentures of the sort uh um, yep. partial even um but has that progressed since then yes so um milling of dentures is definitely possible and it, i think it just determined it's really determined by the laboratory and what mm. equipment and things they have so it's not as simple as asking a local lab or just do it you know it, it sometimes it, it pays to actually understand what is their capacity yes or do we do we have to go elsewhere for example so um and that's where the communication between the laboratory becomes really important because they they can enlighten you as to okay well for with with our capability this is what we can do or mm -hmm. or we could do parts of the process so right now i mean from a manufacturer point of view, I've been getting um, 3D printed um, cast frameworks. So instead of being fabricated as a, instead of being traditionally cast like a gold restoration or a framework, they're actually just 3D printing the metal frameworks. So, um, and that wow. can be done, that can be done in most cases with a single intraoral scan. Wow. So not, not even a secondary, so a single intraoral scan. So that's one way that it can make pro certain processes more efficient. Yeah. Um, that does that does that apply to every scenario? There are some scenarios where that's not a good idea, but yeah. overall, in many cases, you can skip certain steps because of the application of digital technology. Mm, wow. I guess so, yeah maybe in the next few years time we'll get more information about it once and more technicians also bring that on board we might see that as something that might transition to more general yeah and and that's something that is is progressively being advanced on year on year so yeah. what we have now is is more capability than what we had three or four years ago and similarly before, before that, that as well too. yeah yeah, yeah. And so, so we would need to keep up on, we, everyone needs to, everyone with an interest in prosthodontics needs to keep up with what's available Yes. in order to, uh, in order to capitalize on it, you make use of it. So, mm. um, so of all the CPDs that you've done, you know, whether it be in general to, or in, um, so when you've, after you specialized, has there been one that's been a, you know, a game changer for you or dentistry? I, I would say every CPD course that we've done has contributed in some way to how we think and how we practice. So some are, are much more subtle than others. Um, so, so for that reason, I've got two that I'll probably say that has the greatest influence on me. And then the one was that 
full mouth rehab course that I did in Sydney. And and it may and, and it may just be also for me the timing as well as the actual course itself. Right. And so for me, that was um, Tony Rotondo, Michael Mandacos, uh, Mark Ian Hupolo, um were the three main people involved in that course at the time. This is the mini residency one, right? It's Well, they do mini residencies, but they also do like a two-day um, didactic. Yes. On that. So, um, so, and that was in Sydney, as I said at the time. So we we're just in a hotel for two days talking about... Um, uh, full mouth rehabilitations. Yes. So, and as I said, that as for me, as I said, it was not not just the content but the timing. Um, it opened my up into my opened my eyes up into so much more that we hadn't been exposed to in dental school, um, at least not to the same degree. Yeah. So not only about full mouth reconstruction, but aesthetics, about occlusion, um, it, it in in a lot more detail than than um, my understanding was at the time. Mm-hmm. So, and vertical dimension, for example, that was a big thing as well for me. So that was one. The other course that was probably very influential was, um, was um, I did a, um, initially I did a, a short, like a one day course for um, the learning uh, complete dentures. Uh, that was the suction effective mandibular complete denture technique by Dr. Jira Abe. So he came out to Sydney. Yes. And um, we and he he would come to Australia actually very regularly. Actually, that I found out and and do courses not only for general general public but also for their instructors. You know, like the the ones that are now teaching it on his behalf. I guess. Yes. In that sense. So, yeah. So, um, and that sort of opened my eyes up into getting uh i already lo- liked removable pros before this by the way so mm-hmm. but what that did is is um exposed me to not just the, the the really technical aspects that are slightly different from what i was already doing but also a, a philosophy and the philosophy was um to provide the the, the best removable pros care um, because not everyone can afford implants. Not everyone can afford um, fixed pro- fixed implant prosthetics. I love doing them, but that doesn't mean everyone's going to be able to, to do them. So, yes. and, and it just really gelled in with what I wanted to do as a prosthodontist is not to be, um, is, is to, to be a bit more, is to be accessible. I didn't want to be the um, the super ultra fancy boutique <laughs> prosthodontist. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. And and so that fit in a bit more with my personality of what I wanted to do, as well as my my um my ethic, my my um work ethic and things like that. So I wanted to be able to offer the offer these things as a gen genuine option, as opposed to oh we can do this because you can't afford it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I hear you what you're saying. Yeah, because a lot yeah. of times it is can be quite expensive when you do all the crowns and um, all the bridges or implants. Um, and dentistry is one way that we can re- give them their full uh, mouth rehabilitation, but at a more affordable price um, given what they're after. Yeah. And, and also understanding that we can't satisfy everyone that way and trying to predict the ones that we're likely to satisfy and the ones that we aren't. So, so there's a, so, um, th- that, that's something that sort of, um, developed over time from post-grad, but also through, um, courses afterwards. Mm. So, uh, after that one, I, I took the opportunity to actually fly to Japan and um, did a, a hands-on course with him there as well. Yes. And so that was with um, three or four patients in his practice and literally with him over the shoulder watching how he did all the technical aspects of what wow. his technique. Yes, <laughs> yes. That's and perfect, also, yeah. And also, just as a, an aside, he, um, the course, it was two days. Half a day was devoted to lab work. Right, right. 
So what the, and and this is for the clinicians. This is, they, they have a separate course for for um, technicians. Right. So I think the I think the importance of how the laboratory work was done was actually part of the the precision that's involved in the whole process. And so if the clinician doesn't understand that, how is he going to communicate to the technician who's not as initiated? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, of, you know, like what, what's involved, how it should be shaped, how it should be um, set up and things like that. So. Wow. Yeah, so... That, wasn't, that sounds like it was a pretty interesting course because you got to one, work with patients on it because, you know, yeah. there's not a lot of those courses out there. A lot of it's no, you know, there isn't. on models. Exactly. And then they took you to explaining you why this has to be made like this is the way it it why it has to be done this way for it to work as opposed to yeah. this is how you should do it and then go on absolutely yeah so yeah. for me it was clinically applicable uh, for me because i was already doing a fair amount of removable pros but then i can take it a bit more step further and i started in introducing a bit more bits and pieces to my practices that i was yeah. working at at the time so yeah, so I'm um, so I so what I didn't do, and this is this is just my, me generally, is I took influences from everywhere, not just one particular workflow, or one particular item. So um, I don't, for example, I don't necessarily use all Ivercloud products throughout the whole process because um, although it's fairly heavily Ivercloud leaning, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. So yes. the the whole process. So. Um, but also just um, taking into account the knowledge of that we've taken from so many different sources. So not to bind yourself by one philosophy, but to take a few different approaches and philosophies and blend things together. And that's what I've also done as well. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I was, we were talking to Sahil before as well. He was just, you know, it wasn't one particular composite course that really changed him. It was a it was a lot of these other ones that he was attending along the way. It was building up his knowledge, but it was kind of like this one that kind of helped bind it all together. But he said that if you attended just that course, that wouldn't have changed it. It was, it had to 100%. be a build up. Yeah. hundred percent. It is an accumulation of experience and knowledge, not just, um, not just following one process at, at the exclusion of everything else. Yeah. At least that's, that's how I feel anyway. So, mm. So was there um, any particular CPD that you felt that you didn't quite implement um, or wasn't as beneficial for you at the time? I mean, you might've mentioned it with maybe the all on four at the time. The all on four probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that um, early on, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, because that early on in our career, that's kind of, it was it was kind of like um, an area fair concept to me at the time. So yes. um, partly because working in the country, I'd say I'd, we'd rarely get anyone that would be willing to spend the coin on that as well. So. Yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. So yeah. who's been pivotal in your career path? Who's been pivotal? I think, um, and and this is, I guess there's, there's a lot of people involved in getting getting us to where we're, getting, uh, getting me to where I am today. I mean, if you're talking about, Who's pivotal? I mean, the first one would probably be my parents to start with, <laughs> so yeah. to allow me to to. Uh, otherwise, I, I wouldn't have been in Adelaide in the first place. So I'm from Melbourne originally, and um, if it wasn't for their support, you know, I can't. I wouldn't have gone into done dentistry because I had to do dentistry in Adelaide. So that's right. Yeah, there's that. Um, but from a from a course point of view, I mean, we um, particularly when it comes to pros in general. So there's Prof Professor Ivan Kleinberg who ran the pros course at the time. Yes. Um, and he's, I think that him, um, I would say pretty much every, um, every tutor that we had, um, because they spent a lot of time with us, sometimes out of hours just to, to get us through. Um, and I couldn't thank them enough to, to go through that with us. And, and then, Professor um, Professor Kleinberg also really fostered my interest in education, um, in in terms of um, uh, teaching. So he helped me. Um, one of the things he did was he sponsored me to um, recommended me to go to the Young Prosthodontic Educators Conference in Germany. 
Wow. So that yeah. was at the time that was held in Germany every two two years or so. Yes. So um, so after I graduated um, and I had my position in Sydney Sydney Uni, they uh, I was um, I was nominated to to attend that, and so I think that really helped cement my desire to keep teaching to keep um, in in one form or another. So mm. I don't do as much now as I as I did before, partly because of um, um, the new new gen- new practice that we're running. But um, um, and so that's why I'm also branching out into um, hopefully hopefully running more CPD courses, COVID willing. <laughs> so. Yes, yes. <laughs> So, has there been any particular struggles in your dental CPD um, journey so far that some of our viewers might not know about? So, I think, I mean, the the the, the main struggles was I think learning what's the best way to learn, and and that's um that's something that was actually really difficult for me because I didn't know um, how I learned best. I had a fairly shotgun approach to <laughs> to learning. Yeah. I'll try watching videos. I'll try doing hands-on. I'll try reading, and I don't think I knew really well the um, the best way I I, I learned throughout uh, until um, until I think probably after um, graduating dentistry. I mean, a lot of the times I was working with um, working with other uh, dental students and just trying uh, almost um, studying by myself, studying with other people, trying to do whatever I could to keep afloat of yes. uh, how, how I how I learned and how I taught myself, I guess, in that sense. So what I did learn, um, and this was after dental school, was that um, it was, I was, I was not, I didn't take in theory very well. And I was a lot more of an, an, an applied person so mm-hmm. hands-on courses or courses which um did um uh i think that were less didactic and more um more okay well in thinking about the situations thinking mm-hmm. about what to do where rather than and rather than being recipes to memorize yeah so the ones that made me think were the probably the ones that had a lasting impression on me. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like just what you've said before. It was um, with Dr. Abe's one, it was like you could apply it on the patients and it was kind of explaining to you um, as you were kind of going what you're Absolutely. looking for. And that was so, how you were kind of piecing it all together as opposed to being like them just feeding you all this information but not being able to apply it in practice. And not be yeah. able to see how it all comes together. So, and I, and I think that blending of the theory and practice is probably the, the biggest aspect of it. So, um, because we are inherently we are we are um, we are a, a, um, a hands-on profession in most yeah. cases. So, um, and if we're and it's that sort of kinesthetic learning that that um, for me. Uh, and and I think that's probably what was naturally attract, attracted me to dentistry in the first place. I, I didn't know it at the time, but that's probably why that mm-hmm. I didn't feel comfortable in front of a computer eight, eight hours a day doing IT. <laughs> yes, yes. I liked it as a hobby, but I did not like it as a something as a career because I'm I'm just sitting in front of the computer typing. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yes. So, yeah, I mean, I know you have a special interest in REM pros, but what does your ideal clinical day look like? You know, the type of procedures you might be getting up to. So my ideal day, I mean, is one where I can see, um, firstly, see what, what I've got for the day. And then usually it's a mix of um, fixed implanted and REM pros. So I do as, a, um, so I've, if, if 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 you if I was to divvy it up, I mean, it'd probably be like in thirds, to be honest. So, <laughs> yeah, but as you know, that it doesn't always happen, and and most of the time it comes in waves. So there'll be a few weeks where I'm I'm mostly doing complete denture or rem pros work, and then there, and then there's a few weeks that I'm doing just almost all recon work. So. Yes, yes, <laughs> I, I guess that's how it always is. 
Um, yeah, so, so what do you hope your ideal, you know, clinical or non-clinical day to look like in five years time? Yeah, so I think I'm hoping that I'm uh, in, in a position where I can do about four days a week long going because I can then spend a bit more time with the family <laughs> and, mm. and, um, and then maybe half a day or a day of sort of administrative work and reports and letters and things to catch up on so that my um weekends can, can be clear and i'm hoping i can get to that in the next few years so. <laughs> <laughs> is there any particular cpd that you want to do or you're interested in doing you know maybe when covid kind of walk um uh, uh you know when the borders to open up yeah so i think i think from there i mean my i mean we've in in our pros program we've done quite a lot of um you know sort of implant rehabilitation pros and that sort of stuff so um what i probably would like to do is more of a, a bit of a more of an update on that so mm. and and not just um not just uh, uh um didactically but hands-on as well so um uh, because it's um i think that's that's probably where i'd like to take it at the moment and and that's partly because now we've got um as you probably know, we've got um, Dr. Leo on board in 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 our practice. So um, yes. generally, um, generally these sort of courses work well when you go in as a pros surgical team, as opposed to um, one person go one and the other person go separately. So yes. So I think that's that's probably where I'll go once COVID probably um, take um, takes a bit of a hold and. Uh, uh, um allows us to travel a bit more yeah and and also yeah just the um yeah just and also working um uh, maxillofacial pros which is um as you know, um so patients who have suffered um a lot of tooth and bone loss due to oral cancer or injuries or or otherwise so um, I, I did have an in, uh, interest in that, but um, it's obviously not a very common um, uh, condition to come across in Australia. So a lot of the courses for that for that are usually in the US. Mm, so yeah, yeah. So once that borders there. open up, you'll be able to fly over there and then do it. Yeah. That. So that's yeah. That's one of that's w one of the interests that was fostered in postgraduate. But mm -hmm. as I said, outside of that, it's not there's nothing there's not as many courses on that in australia for for surgical and restorative specialists here so i would love to um be a little bit more um experienced in that as well so yeah and then maybe one day you could bring it here as well yeah so uh, that'll be <laughs> that'll be awesome <laughs> so you currently run a course on non-implant options for a single missing teeth you know yes. how did that come about and how do you kind of support your you know participants during and after it so that to be honest that sort of came about with what we were talking about before is having a, a didactic course that you can immediately apply hands-on straight away um because not everyone out uh, post-graduation goes straight into doing implant surgeries or want to do implant surgeries so you need to know what sort of um options are out there al alternate to that um which and it's not necessarily a denture so you kind of um but you to to apply it critically working out what scenarios where it's good or what not good and then also then the hands-on practice of actually preparing or taking impressions for or, or making temporaries for these sort of prostheses or procedures so um michael frazes and i did um sort of come up with this um the year before and we made it a reality last year even even though covid hit we were able to um service a small batch on as a hands-on component and then a larger group as a didactic component online right so um base and covid willing we will we'll be running that again this year so um hopefully and um if it all works out, then I'd, I'd like to keep this as an ongoing course and it's specifically designed for recent graduates. So 
um, because as as I, as I mentioned before, um, this is how it worked for me: is a didactic where you can just apply it ideally straight away, and then soon after in your own practice. So, mm. uh, and that's what I'm hoping that the attendees get out of this one as well. Yeah, I mean, I guess for a lot of recent graduates, you know, it's not common that they come um, with cases that have multiple missing teeth. It's more common that you might have, you know, one tooth that needs to be removed and then or, replacing it. And, yeah. Yeah. So one or two teeth, you know, the, the, the concepts are fairly similar from that. So, and so that's the reason why uh, um, we designed that that sort of course because um yes an implant is an option but there are some reasons why that may not be the case with whether it be physical limitations or cost so mm. and you kind of want to have a few things up your sleeve that and be confident in saying that it's still an acceptable or the right thing to do yeah i think that's i think that's a great message to do for recent graduates so dr shravan chandaru thank you so much for your time today um if you could let the people know how they can find you or what you've got going on in your life so um i'm on instagram as at dr shravan pros um and then also um my practice page is adelaidecad.com.au adelaidecad.com.au um, and people can feel free to message me through the social medias or, or, or through the, through our website as well. Um, but yeah, thank you. And thanks for very much for having me on Lawrence. It's all good. So for our viewers, if you like this episode, drop a comment below on your favorite part, but don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you on the next episode of CPD Junkie podcast.